Okay. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> so can you see a slide with the earth? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, my topic is oceans, atmospheres and climates. And let me begin by saying thank you very much for the invitation to talk with you. Um, I, I don't know much about Maryland Natural History Society, but I'm eager to learn. And I hope what I have to say um, is interesting to you. It expands beyond the bounds of Maryland and it looks at our planet kind of like from this perspective on large scales and also long time scales. So before I start, let me say a little about me. Oops. There we go. Um, as Bronwyn said, I'm a professor in Earth and Planetary Sciences at Hopkins. Uh, my training is in physics and in oceanography. I study ocean circulation and dynamics. And here is a selection of some of the things that I think about. A lot of my work has been to do with what we call the subpolar North Atlantic Ocean, which is between Canada, Greenland, and Northwest Europe, the Nordic Seas, and the Arctic. So we think about the currents in this system. And this animation here is showing the flow of little drifting particles in the ocean circulation between Greenland and Iceland from one of the papers a few years ago. So I do ocean circulation models. I simulate the ocean currents. Um, I work with people who make observations. I've been to see many times myself. So in the background, you see a picture of Iceland and this beautiful green, blue, purple color is the color of the chlorophyll from phytoplankton. So the plant material growing in the surface of the water, which we can see from space. I do theory. Bronwyn said I shouldn't have any equations. I'm sorry, I had to put one in, but it's just a placeholder. There aren't going to be any more. Um, I teach. Here's the front cover of the book I, um, that Bronwyn mentioned. And then over here on the right-hand side, so my family, my wife and I have four kids between us. They're all in their 20s at various stages going through university. And I'm, I'm originally from the UK, but I've been in the US for uh, nearly 25 years. Okay, so... Let's think about our planet, and in particular, North America, 20,000 years ago, because the climate was very different at that time. And this is an artist's impression of what the globe might look like, kind of corresponding to the one that you saw on the, on the opening slide. And the principal difference is that you can see all of this white stuff over the Arctic and here's Northwest Europe, Greenland is here and then over North America. So this is the ice age. This is the last glacial maximum. And Earth has been in a phase of, sorry, um, sliding into ice ages for about 80 or 100,000 years and then rapidly deglaciating for about 10 or 15 or 20,000 years and then sliding into an ice age for many cycles, for the last two or three million years. And, oops, sorry, I'm having a bit of problems here. Okay, here's a picture that shows the extent of the ice sheet at the last glacial maximum of 20,000 years ago over North America. And this is called the Laurentide ice sheet. And so you can see the outlines of states. So the, the ice ended, the ice sheet ended somewhere close to Harrisburg. It did not go all the way as far as Maryland, but it was pretty close. Um, and then it extended over most of uh, Northeast US and Canada. Um, and there was also a large ice sheet, much larger than today, uh, in the Antarctic and in the um, high latitude land in the Southern Hemisphere. So here's a pic, oops, sorry. Here's a picture that shows um, the relative thickness of the ice sheets for various important cities 21,000 years ago at the last glacial maximum. So here's Chicago, skyline 900 meters of ice over Chicago, Boston 1250, Toronto 2100, Montreal 3300. So this ice sheet was thick and it was there for tens of thousands of years. Now, if you look closely at the 
map on the right hand side and look at the coastline, for example, here in the southeast of the US, you can see that the, the, the US kind of looks a bit bloated, kind of looks like it's grown somewhat. And that's not accidental, it's deliberate on the, per, on the part of the person who drew this picture, because at this time, sea level was lower, it was significantly lower. In fact, we think it was about 120 meters lower than it is today, so about 400 feet. So that's why Florida looks much bigger than it does today, for example. And the coastline at Ocean City, for example, that would have been 40 miles from the, the water from the beach. And so over here on the right hand side, you can see some data showing the way in which sea level has changed over the last 120,000 years. Okay, so 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum. Sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is today. And the reason for that is that a large part of the ocean was stored in ice sheets on land, like in the Laurentide ice sheet. And so sea level was just lower for that reason. Now in the upper panel, you can see some more data showing the last glaciation and it shows in red the temperature variation so it's an ice age it's colder and during the last glacial maximum it was about eight or ten degrees colder on a global average than it is today and then you can see it rapidly increases to about zero for the last ten thousand years during the deglace during the deglaciation and then the blue line shows the concentration of CO2 in the air, in the atmosphere. And these data are from an ice core in Vostok. So Vostok is a location in Antarctica. So you drill an ice core, you analyze the gas dissolved in bubbles to estimate the CO2. And then the temperature comes from uh, an isotope called deuterium. Okay, so we know this really quite well. The planet was different 20,000 years ago. Sea level was lower, it was colder, and there was less CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, now we can go even further back in time. So what I'm gonna play for you now is we're gonna go back half a billion years. And you can see the clock ticking here, going backwards in time in millions of years so we're now at 30 million years and the point of me showing you this animation is that you can now start to see the continents drifting so during the last ice age the continents were in the same place but go back tens of millions of years and they were not they drift so the atlantic ocean is closing up as we go back 100 million years ago it's almost entirely closed here's india which is tracking back to close to be the, to the South Pole. Now the Atlantic is almost completely closed up. And the Pacific is much wider than it is today. The Pacific today is already half of our planet, but at this time, 170 million years ago, it was maybe three quarters of our planet. And now it accelerates a little bit to get back to half a billion years ago. You can see the continents moving around. And if you follow my cursor, which I hope you can see, you can see the outlines of the US states. So it stops about now. So this chunk is called the Laurentide Craton. It's, the, it's part of the Earth's crust, continental crust, um, which forms North America and Canada today. And you can see it's moved all over the surface of the planet. So 540 million years ago, half a billion years ago, the configuration of the, of the continents on our planet was completely different. It's continental drift. Now our climate was completely different as well. So I just mentioned ice ages, it was eight degrees colder, sea level was 120 meters lower, and it lasted for about 80,000 years. Okay, well, 500 million years ago, there was an even bigger monster ice age and it's called a snowball climate and in the snowball climate you can see an impression from a, a narcissist impression of what it might the planet what might look like at that time the entire planet is covered with ice so in the upper panel here you can make out roughly speaking the positions of the continents so this would be Laurentia okay which became North America and Canada 
And then you can see the thickness of the ice sheets over them. Okay, so 5,000 meters thick. And there are ice sheets all the way to the equator. And the large ocean is covered in a really thick layer of marine sea ice. And this diagram here shows the kinds of thicknesses we're talking about. So this is the thickness of the ice over the sea, 300 meters, 700 meters, maybe even up to 1500 meters thick. So the entire planet is encased in ice. It's much, much colder. So the diagram here shows the kinds of temperatures that one might expect as a function of the latitude here. So you're talking, so, that, so sorry, the dashed line is the melting point temperature for fresh water. So the temperature is in Kelvin. So that's 273. So you're talking even at the equator, at maybe minus 10 centigrade or minus 20 centigrade. So the same kind of temperatures you would get on a really cold day in Maryland in winter now. Um, if it was a really deep snowball climate, it might be 40 or 50 degrees centigrade below freezing. And then at the poles, you're talking about minus 100 degrees C. So this snowball earth, this snowball climate was radically different to the climates of today and also the climate of the ice age 20,000 years ago. We had a very weak hydrological cycle. The hydrological cycle is evaporation of water off the ocean or off bodies of water on the land, transport in the atmosphere, condensation, precipitation. Because it, because it was so cold, it was freeze dried. The hydrological cycle was much, much weaker than it was today. There was life at this time very primitive life, not really the kind of thing that we would recognize as uh, modern forms of life, but um, the life was confined to niches called refugia, where the local environmental conditions were sufficiently um, habitable for them to survive. And this ice age didn't last tens of thousands of years. It last, lasted hundreds, sorry, excuse me. It lasted tens of millions of years. Now we see snowball climates on other bodies in our solar system. So here's a, a moon of Jupiter. It's one of the Galilean satellites of Jupiter called Europa and it has an ice shell. So this is a NASA mission that went there 20 years ago. And we think that this has some similarities to the state of the earth five, 600 million years ago. So we expect that the earth can inhabit this snowball climate and we think that it moved into a snowball configuration and out of a snowball configuration many times during geological history so that's what this diagram shows here so on the bottom you see nearly the entire history of the earth so it goes back his time it goes back to three thousand million years or three billion years ago so the earth is about four and a half billion years old. And so we're right over here on the right hand side. Okay, well, this light colored patch here means that there's regional ice ages. So we're in a phase of Earth's history where we have glaciations, which it, the ice sheets expand, but they don't go all the way to the equator. Then they contract, then they expand again, then they contract. But there were also these periods of snowball Earth. So the the main one is here between about 620 and 740 million years ago. So the biggest one is called the Sturtian. It lasted 50 million years. And there's a Maranoan, which lasted 15 million years. For some reason, then there's this gap going back in Earth's history for 1.5 billion years with no glaciations. And then there are more glaciations nearly two and a half billion years ago. So our planet can inhabit radically different climate states. And in case you're wondering, this is all for the same sunshine intensity. So the sun's output has not changed over this kind of, not changed significantly over this kind of time span. So this going into and out of ice ages is to do with some internal process in the earth. Okay, so let's try and understand that a little bit more. And we're gonna, we're gonna address that by thinking about the present day Earth.
because we, of course we know much more about the climate of the present day earth and so i come back to the figure that i started with so you have all seen this picture i guarantee because it is one of the most widely distributed photographs i think in the history of our species um, and it is an opportunity for you to interact um, i'm going to ask you a couple of questions i'll give you i'll give you a little bit of information then i'll ask you a couple of questions so the first question the first piece of information is to tell you that this picture was taken with a regular camera, uh, like a like a film camera. Okay, it was not a digital camera, but it was a it was a regular film camera. So this is actually what it looked like, and it was taken uh, with a camera in the hands of an astronaut on the way to the moon. So you can see Africa, for example, and the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, and so on. So my question to you, I can ask some kind of strange questions. At least they initially seem to be strange. Um, what time of day was it when this picture was taken? Does anybody Don't have any idea? Put your answers in the chat box or if you want to. Oh, yeah, that'd be terrific. Yeah. yeah. Anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> Jack says daytime. Kathleen says night. Okay. So that covers it. Okay, let me be a little bit more specific and I'll give you a clue. When I say time of day, I have to be specific about where, right? Because sometimes, I mean, right now it's evening, but the other side of the world, it's dawn. Um, what time of day was it in Baltimore, in Maryland? All right. George says noon and Kathleen says night. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you the answer. It is a few hours before dawn. So I don't know exactly, but let's say four or five a.m. Actually, six a.m. Okay, so how, how, I mean, I know when the picture was taken, um, but that's not how I can figure this out. Um, let's work it out. So this is South Africa, right? So Cape Town is down here. Johannesburg is here. And this is more or less in the middle of this image. So the astronaut in the Apollo space shuttle had the camera, was looking at the Earth, and the sun was at his back. So that means that it was local noon in the center of this picture. So it was about one in the afternoon in Cape Town or Johannesburg. Now, Maryland is over here, right? Over the limb, it's called the limb of the planet. And as the astronaut watches, the planet rotates in front of him. And the way that that would work is um, Africa would slide to the right. And so after a few more hours, the US East Coast would appear over the limb. That is dawn. So that means that this is taken a few hours before dawn in Baltimore, Maryland. You can ask the following question. I've given you a little bit of a clue. What, what month was it taken in? Okay, the month. Kathleen says September, greater than okay. September. David in Maryland says July. And Rich says if it was from Apollo 11, it was July. <laughs> it's not Apollo 11. Okay, I'll tell you. And again, you can look at the picture and you can figure it out once you kind of know the trick. It was December. At least it was northern winter. And the reason for that is this is the Antarctic. This is the Antarctic ice sheet, right? It's illuminated. It's in daylight. It's the sun is up in the Antarctic. And the Arctic is over the limb here. So this has to be polar night in the Arctic, polar day in the Antarctic. So therefore, it has to be in December. It was Apollo 18, and I can't remember the exact date, in December 1972 when this picture was taken. Okay, so I love looking at this picture because it kind of summarizes lots of the things I think about. 
what you can see is the visible light coming back from our planet. So the sun shines on our planet. Some of that light is absorbed. Some of that light is reflected. So for example, the bright white stuff is cloud or ice. And the sun is white light. So most of the light is just being reflected off the cloud or the ice. The ocean looks purple or inky, dark, because most of the light that, uh, that reaches the ocean surface is absorbed and not much is reflected. And land is kind of in between. And you can see the difference between the Sahara Desert or the deserts in Southern Africa and the heavily vegetated Central Africa. Okay, so when you look at this picture, you can think about the way in which the sun's radiation is being absorbed and reflected from our planet back to space. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So what you're going to see now is some sat an animation of some satellite data. So there's a satellite program run by NASA, it's called Ceres, that is looking at the radiation budget of our planet. And what this shows is the shortwave TOA sense for top of the atmosphere flux. So this is just a quantification of what we just saw a second ago. So where, where it is white, you see cloud. So they're bright white clouds which reflect the sunlight back. Where it's dark or, or a, dark, a lighter shade of blue, there's less radiation coming back from our planet because the sunshine that hits that part is absorbed. So that's over the oceans and then over large parts of the land. So satellites like this measure the amount of visible light coming back from our planet as a function of time and place. And they're very useful to construct what's called a heat budget for our planet, which we're going to get to in a second. Now, the visible light is only half of the story if you're trying to construct a heat budget for the planet. The sun is shining on the Earth, warming it up, but the Earth cools by radiating in infrared wavelengths. So these are wavelengths that we cannot see with our eyes. And all objects radiate in the infrared. Um, and it, that radiation depends on their temperature. So the hotter the object, the um, more intense the radiation and also um, the shorter the wavelength. So an object that is super hot, like the sun, it's like five and a half thousand degrees on the surface of the sun, radiates in the visible part of the spectrum. Cooler objects like the surface of the Earth radiate in the infrared wavelengths of the spectrum. Okay, so Ceres, the satellite I just mentioned, measures the top of the atmosphere infrared radiation. Sometimes it's called long wave radiation. And so now you can see a, an interesting pattern. This is much less familiar. It's less familiar to me than the one we just looked at. You can still see cloud. Okay, so the cloud has got relatively low radiation. And then you can see in the tropics, hot places have got high radiative fluxes. And then they tend to get smaller as you go towards the pole. So if you look up here in Canada and the US, um, there's less radiation, long wave radiation coming from those places because they're cooler. Okay, so now let's try and put those pieces together, those ideas to construct a budget for heat for the earth. And I'm gonna step through this. I know there's a lot of numbers and there's a lot of arrows in this picture, but bear with me, we're gonna work through it slowly. The budget is just like a budget of money. So it's just like a spreadsheet of dollars going into and out of an account. And this is the best estimate for our current Earth's heat budget. So let's start over here on the left. We have the sun shining on our planet. And let's not worry about the numbers for right now, just look at the arrows. So some of that incoming radiation is just reflected back out into space by clouds, for example. And that's why we could see the white clouds in the astronaut's photograph. Some of it gets to the surface, some of it is absorbed by the surface, like over the ocean. Some of it is reflected back out into space. That's why we can see the Sahara Desert, for example. Okay, so all the yellow stuff is the visible light. 
and the orange stuff is the infrared. So the way that this works is that hot objects radiate more, hotter objects radiate more infrared radiation. So the surface of our Earth is radiating infrared radiation, but not all of that can escape straight to space. So you can see this big orange arrow is blocked. It's absorbed by the atmosphere, a large part of it. Um, it's absorbed by clouds, and then it is emitted by the atmosphere and also by clouds higher up. Some of it gets through, that's called the atmospheric window, but most of it gets blocked by the atmosphere and sent back down to the earth. And the stuff that eventually leaves through outer space, which is what we just saw in that satellite image of the infrared radiation is coming, is being radiated, is being emitted by the atmosphere and by clouds. And a relatively small part of it is coming directly from the surface of the earth. Okay, and let's not worry about these two for the moment. That's to do with the way in which the atmosphere moves heat and water vapor around. Okay, so I wanna give you some points of reference for this. So it says over here, 340.4, that's watts per meter squared. So that's the total incoming solar radiation. So if you had a, a solar panel, which is one square meter, then you would get 340 watts of power from that, and if it worked 100% efficiently from that solar panel. Okay, and that just that intensity of radiation depends on our distance from the sun. Now, if you add that up over the entire surface of the Earth, you get this number. It says 174 pw. P is peta, 10 to the 15 petawatts. Okay, so what's that? I mean, it sounds like a large number. Let's try and compare that to something that you might have um, a bit more intuition for. So the total amount of power generated by all human activities is about 15. Now we've got TW, that's terra. So that's 10 to the 12. This is 2008. So this is 12,000 times smaller. All of humankind's power generation is 12,000 times smaller than what our sun provides from this incoming radiation here. To compare it to us, our human bodies are working at about 100 watts. Um, which means that we have a per capita power of about 2000 watts, which means that if you divide the total amount of power generated by all of humankind, it's about 2000 watts each. Okay, so a large amount of solar radiation coming in, it dwarfs anything that we can create or generate on Earth. Okay, so I want to convert that now into a temperature. And I use a a uh, law called the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is the thing I was telling you about a moment ago, that hotter bodies radiate more intense radiation. So if you know the temperature of the surface of the earth, you can figure out the amount of radiation, this orange arrow. So that 398.2 is connected directly to a temperature. Okay, well, that 398.2 says that the surface temperature of our planet should be about 16 degrees C. Okay, so I'm mainly going to use uh, Celsius, but there it is in Fahrenheit for a point of reference. But a lot of the infrared radiation leaving our planet is coming from higher up in the atmosphere where it's colder. Okay, because so as I showed you here, most of it doesn't make it through the atmosphere. The atmospheric window is pretty narrow. So that means the planetary temperature is about minus 18 degrees. Okay, so if I take that number and figure out the temperature, I get minus 18 degrees. And so what that means effectively that is that the atmosphere, which is in between this big arrow down here and the one leaving the planet, is warming our planet by the difference between these two numbers. So that's, that's 35 or 40 degrees C, the atmosphere keeps our planet warm by about 30 or 40 degrees C. Okay, now the observed extremes of temperature on our planet today are in this range, minus 89 degrees C to 57 degrees C. So this is, these are the record breaking temperature extremes. Minus 89 actually happens to be at Vostok in Antarctica where I showed you that ice core a moment ago. So it's on the Antarctic plateau. 57 degrees is from Death Valley. Okay, 
Now, wouldn't it be great if we could compare Earth's radiation budget with an object that is otherwise identical, pretty much, but does not have an atmosphere? So we just remove the atmosphere and see what effect that has. Well, it turns out, as you can see now, that there is such an object, it's Earth's moon. And in particular, Earth's moon is at the same distance on average from the sun that the Earth is. So the incoming solar radiation to the moon is the same, more or less, as the incoming solar radiation to the Earth. The moon does not have an atmosphere. That's the major difference. It doesn't have an ocean either. Okay, so the, the corresponding heat budget for the moon is super simple. It's just these arrows here. So we have incoming radiation. Some of that is reflected back by the surface. Okay, that's why we can take this picture of the moon, right? Because the sun's radiation is shining on the surface of the moon then being bounced back into the camera. And then the moon is radiating in the infrared because it's a hot body. And if you figure out these numbers, you get this, 292.7. Okay. Oops, click. Okay. Now, if you take this number, 292.7, figure out the equivalent temperature for the moon, you get about minus five degrees C. Okay, and remember for Earth, it was 16 degrees C. So it's 20 degrees colder for the average of the moon. So that's interesting, but it gets even more interesting when you realize that actually the albedo of the moon is about half the albedo of the Earth. Okay, what is albedo? Albedo means it's from albino whiteness. And it's to do with how much of the solar radiation that comes in the sunshine gets reflected. So the fraction of the reflected radiation to the incoming radiation is the albedo. So for moon, it's about 0.14. For earth, it's about twice that. So earth reflects more radiation than the moon does. Moon rocks are dark, it's like coal. So not only is the moon colder, than Earth by about 20 degrees is also receiving quite a lot more sunshine than the Earth. So Earth's atmosphere is, for both of those reasons, keeping Earth much warmer than it would otherwise be. That's not all. The extreme temperatures on the moon, remember I talked about them on the Earth for a second ago, are really crazy. The coldest point in minus 240 degrees centigrade, the warmest point 120 degrees centigrade. So the range of extreme temperatures on the moon is much greater than the range of extreme temperatures on the earth. So not only does the atmosphere keep our planet warm, it also moderates the extremes of the temperature. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about the greenhouse effects and then I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the um, atmosphere and the ocean more directly. Okay, so the greenhouse effect is the effect that I was talking about a few minutes ago when I was saying infrared radiation leaves the surface of the planet and then is absorbed by the atmosphere. Only a small part of it makes it through. And then the atmosphere itself radiates to space. Okay, well, the diagram on the right hand side shows how that works in a little more detail. So the x axis is the wavelength of the radiation. And over here, at small wavelengths, we have visible light. So this is the spectrum of sunshine. Okay, so you remember you can split the radiation, the sunshine into different wavelengths. And this is what we receive on the surface of the Earth. And this red line here, it says 5,525K, that is the, it's called the black body radiation curve for the surface of our sun. So it's radiating, just like I've been telling you, all hot bodies radiate in the visible. That's why our, 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 our eyes are sensitive to visible light because our planet is illuminated by a star that radiates in those wavelengths. And that corresponds to this uh, surface temperature of the sun. 
Now over here on the right hand side in the blue, you see infrared rate wavelengths. So 10 this is microns, micrometers. And there's three different curves here for three different temperatures. Okay, so the downgoing solar radiation, 70 to 75% gets transmitted to the earth, the rest is reflected. Upgoing thermal radiation, only 15 to 30% makes it through this rather narrow atmospheric window. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the atmosphere is relatively transparent to sunlight, to visible wavelengths, and relatively opaque to infrared wavelengths. So this diagram here shows the absorption and the scattering of light at various different wavelengths. So visible light is not very scattered or absorbed. That's why it's close to zero. And then over here in the infrared wavelengths, it's mainly absorbed and scattered. And there's a rather narrow band of wavelengths here um, where the atmosphere is transparent to infrared radiation. And that's why this stuff can escape. Now, this absorption and scattering is because of trace gases in the atmosphere, principally. The most important of those are water vapor. So this is the contribution of water vapor to the total absorption and scattering and carbon dioxide. This is the contribution of carbon dioxide to total absorption and scattering. And in particular, you can see carbon dioxide has a big absorption peak in the middle of the infrared. So if you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you reduce the amount of infrared radiation that can penetrate through the atmosphere and leave for outer space. So you increase the amount that's absorbed. And for the moment, let's just forget about the other ones there. Okay, so what I would like to do now is to try and make a simple diagram, a schematic of the heat budget for Earth like we had for the moon. So here's the diagram I had for the moon. It's really simple. Sunlight comes in, sun is reflected, the moon radiates, and that tells you its temperature. That's with no atmosphere. So the Earth has an atmosphere. Sunlight comes in, some of it gets reflected, but more than on the moon, because it's got a higher albedo. And the atmosphere is absorbing some of the infrared radiation, in fact, most of the infrared radiation that is being radiated from the surface. And then it radiates that back in turn, back down to the ground. And the radiation, the infrared radiation that makes it out to space is being radiated by the atmosphere itself. Now, in order to strike a budget overall so that the total amount of energy coming in from the sun is equal to the total amount of energy leaving the system, you have to have a hot surface so that you radiate lots of energy into the atmosphere so that some of it will get through to balance the total amount of incoming solar radiation from the sun. And so this atmosphere, this layer, this is the greenhouse effect, is like a blanket on our planet. It keeps the surface much warmer than it would otherwise be. That's why the surface of our planet is about 30 degrees C warmer than on average than the moon. Okay, well, what about the moderation of the extremes in temperature? So I said there was two big effects that the atmosphere has. One is it warms the planet overall. Two is that it moderates the extremes in temperature. So to think about that, let's look at the way in which the radiation coming into our planet from the sun and leaving our planet depends on the latitude okay so here's some diagrams two diagrams showing the short wave that's the visible radiation from the ceres satellite in dashed and long wave that's the infrared radiation from the ceres satellite so they they make the measurements and they average it around the planet and then they plot it as a function of latitude and then they also average over the year so there's no seasonal cycle okay so the short wave radiation unsurprisingly peaks in the tropics and the low latitudes and is lowest at the poles okay 60, uh, 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south OK, and it's more or less symmetric about the equator, and we can talk about why it's not exactly symmetric if you're interested. The long wave, that's the infrared, has more or less the same shape. It's peaked in the tropics. Tropics are warmer. That makes sense. It's minimum, 
minimal at the poles. But notice that it does not lie on top of the shortwave dashed line. So what does that mean? It means that in low latitudes, there's an excess of radiation coming in from the sun compared to the amount of radiation that is leaving the planet as infrared radiation. Conversely, at high latitudes, there is a deficit of sunshine coming in compared to the amount of infrared radiation which is leaving. So there's an imbalance in latitude, too much coming in in low latitudes, too little coming in in high latitudes. What gives? How is that maintained? Well, what it means is that there is a shift, a transport of heat. The excess heat from the tropics gets shifted north in the northern hemisphere and south in the southern hemisphere. And there is a heat transport. That's what this shows here, northward heat transport. Let's look at the northern hemisphere. So this is latitude. The heavy line shows the total northward heat transport. And it's measured in this PW unit, petawatts. It peaks at about five and a half petawatts. So just for comparison again, total solar power is about 174 petawatts. So that's what, 30 times bigger than this. Human power is a measly 15 terawatts. Okay, now how is that achieved? How is that heat shunted north in the northern hemisphere and, and south in the southern hemisphere? It's done by the atmosphere in the ocean. So this does not happen on the moon. This is how the atmosphere in the ocean moderate the extremes of temperature on the surface of our planet. And the dashed line shows the amount of heat carried by the atmosphere. The thin line shows the amount of heat carried by the ocean. The atmosphere is bigger overall by about a factor of two or three, but at low latitudes, the ocean dominates. The ocean has this, it's asymmetric about the equator for interesting reasons that we don't have time to talk about. And so this, the final text here just shows the effect of this heat transport on the extremes in temperature. So it moderates the temperature range from what would be about minus 70 at the coldest point to plus 45 degrees C. At the hottest point without an ocean and an atmosphere to a much more habitable minus 18 to 28. So minus 18 at the pole and 28 at the tropics. Okay, well, how does the ocean and the atmosphere carry this heat? This is a large amount of heat. It does it by the atmospheric winds and the ocean currents. And so I just want to, I, I'm, I have uh, two or three more slides I want to wrap up by showing you a little bit about the atmospheric general circulation and then the ocean general circulation. And so this is a, this is a beautiful animation of over a period of about six weeks showing weather for our globe. And what you can see, this smoky white stuff is water vapor in the atmosphere. It's the total amount of water vapor um, added up over the entire atmosphere. The atmosphere is warmer in low latitudes, and so it holds more water vapor than in the higher latitudes. And if you look carefully, you can see features of the general circulation of the atmosphere. In low latitudes, you can see the kind of smoky stuff kind of slowly shifting towards the left. That's west, like here in the Atlantic. It's true in the Pacific as well. These are the trade winds. They blow towards the west. And then in middle latitudes, let's look in the North Atlantic, you can see these beautiful spiral swirling eddies, vortices. These are atmospheric weather systems. These are the cyclones that bring us weather. And you can see that what's going on in the Northern Hemisphere is kind of analogous to what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. It's not many people live in these latitudes in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can fit about six or eight of these weather systems around the planet at any one time. And they, on average, move towards the east. In other words, they're going to the right. Where the yellow stuff, it's beautiful to watch it, is regions of active precipitation. 
So you can see one of these storms track across the North Atlantic and then it hits land like over the mountains in Norway and it all rains out. You can see the same thing in the west coast of the US where it hits the Sierras or in the Aleutians. Now, how does how is the atmosphere carrying heat? Well, look at the smoke penetrating up here into the Nordic seas between Greenland and Norway. This is warm, moist air, which is being carried to the north by the atmospheric cyclones, by the weather systems. So the weather systems in the middle latitudes are carrying this heat. The excess heat that is in the tropics uh, to fill the deficit of heat in the polar latitudes. Okay, so now let me show you, I'm just gonna end it by showing you what the ocean circulation is like, at least a glimpse. So here's the US, here's Maryland, and what you're looking at here is the ocean currents. And you can see the Gulf Stream. Here's Florida, here's the Bahamas, the Gulf Stream. And now we're rolling over to the equatorial Atlantic and it's, it's about to loop. Let me start again. Let me just pause it. Oops, back. There, pause. So in a snapshot, you see this narrow, rapid current that's the Gulf Stream move up the east coast of the US and then break into these meanders and form these eddies, these vortices, these cyclones and anticyclones. So these are the equivalent in the ocean circulation of the weather systems that we saw in the atmosphere a moment ago, except notice that they're much smaller. Their diameter is a factor of 10 or 20 times smaller than it is in the atmosphere. So we can't fit six or eight around the planet, we can fit 60 or 80 around the planet. <clears throat> and these are the eddies in the ocean that are carrying the heat, like the eddies in the atmosphere are carrying the heat poleward. So the ocean takes warm water from the tropics, moves it north, for example, in the Gulf Stream, and then spreads it out towards northwest Europe in what's called the North Atlantic Current as the Gulf Stream heads out towards the east. Okay, so here's, I showed, showed you this figure a moment ago. This heat transport carried by the ocean and the atmosphere together collaboratively keeps the extremes of our temperature on, on planet Earth much more moderate than they would be in the absence of an ocean or an atmosphere like on the moon. Okay, so this is where I'd like to end. I hope that I've convinced you that studying the ocean circulation and the atmospheric circulation is interesting for these reasons amongst many, many others. So let me conclude. Um, Earth's temperature rises from its energy budget. Remember the watts per meter squared, like a budget of dollars. Shortwave radiation and longwave radiation are the key elements of that energy budget and they behave differently. The ocean and the atmosphere redistribute heat energy polewards and they make the planet much more hospitable for people than it would otherwise be. And then radically different climates are possible and they have occurred in the past without any change to the sunshine that's reaching our planet. So think about 20,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum or 500 million years ago when we were in a snowball earth. That's due to internal dynamics in the planet. And then the final comment is about habitability, like habitability for um, life like us. I mean, animals, plants, animals, advanced life forms, not, not microbial life like bacteria and so on. Um, here, are the, here are the themes that I've touched on that relate to habitability. The presence of three phases of water so that means ice, liquid water, and vapor. Um, that means the temperature has to be close to the triple, it's called the triple point of water. Sometimes you talk about that as the Goldilocks zone. So the planet is just the right distance from the sun so that you can have all three phases present at once. The ice affects the albedo. So as the ice expands, the albedo increases and the planet can radiate more sunshine away. Um, the water vapor in the atmosphere uh, carries uh, heat from the equator to the poles and that I just described. 
So that's that's uh, sort of key point number one. The second is the greenhouse effect. So the most important greenhouse gases are water vapor and CO2. And processes on our planet control the concentrations of those gases. Okay, so water vapor, I've mentioned that more than once. That's part of the hydrological cycle. That's a really important greenhouse gas. I've not talk about, talked about CO2 cycling very much, um, but there are really important feedback processes that control the concentrations of atmospheric CO2 as well that are internal to the Earth. And then the final thing is, I think, for a planet to be habitable, it would have to have fluid ocean, excuse me, a fluid Earth. In other words, it would have to have an atmosphere uh, and also possibly an ocean. And then the key themes that are involved there are to do with the radiative transfer, the fluid dynamics and the thermodynamics of those fluid earth elements. Okay, that is everything I had. Thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Hain. That was amazing. Can you unshare? We'll come back together and I'll do questions and answers. I'll help you here. Oh, no. I thought I could. Tom, can you can you unshare? Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. Um, if you want to be um, to Just ask Tom a question, Dr. Hain a question, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Okay, there's a question um, here about worst okay. case scenarios for current climate change. Yeah, so I, I steered clear of global warming and anthropogenic climate change, not because that's not important, but that's just the choice that I had. So the planet is, many of the things I've spoken about are changing. Um, one of the things that we think is going to happen in the 21st century is that the strength of the circulation, the currents in the ocean in the North Atlantic are gonna, are gonna weaken. And that may or may not be manifested as a weakening of the Gulf Stream. And part of the reason for that is that it's, there's lots of melting ice in the North Atlantic, and it's also getting warmer in the North Atlantic, um, which means that the density of the water is decreasing. Um, what in the time frame for such a disaster? Okay, so the time frame for the so people talk about weakening of the circulation in the North Atlantic Ocean, and also shutdown, which are two different things. The time scale for weakening, we think it's going to weaken over the next several decades and maybe a couple of centuries, and we think almost certainly that's going to happen, but maybe it's going to weaken by twenty percent or thirty percent maybe it will weaken and then recover it might shut off and we don't really have a good handle on what the chances of that happening are um, if it does shut off it might happen as fast as 10 or 20 years but that's got a really large error bar on it that number and it's an area of active research the other thing for me to say is i don't think the gulf stream itself is ever going to just shut off it's just that the penetration of the warm water up into the North Atlantic near Europe and um, Iceland and so on will reduce and the, instead the water will flow more directly east towards Africa. Um, uh, Cheryl asks, have you done any projections yeah, on okay. farther out? Okay. Uh, have you done any projections of what climate might look like in the in the far future. Most climate projections end in 2200. Some go as far as 2500. Sorry, 2000, yeah, 2500, 2500. Um, they're highly uncertain. So on those kind of timescales, it makes a huge difference how much greenhouse gas we emit into the atmosphere. So a large part of the uncertainty about future climate is to do with how we change our infrastructure for energy generation, uh, for example, um, and use of fossil fuels and 
land use changes, deforestation, and so on, and emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and I think people can, I mean, the socioeconomic predictions can look forward a few decades, and then there are various scenarios about how that might play out as a business as usual scenario where we don't shift away from fossil fuel energy production and then there's an optimistic scenario where we do that rapidly and we become carbon neutral fast um, but going past 2100 to guesstimate what the emissions will be like is really really uncertain so everything i think depends on that the continents aren't going to move around on that, that time scale and the if there had been no anthropogenic effects and there had been no global warming the earth would have been poised to slowly slide into another glaciation which might take the next 60 or 80,000 years and so the ice sheets would take 60 or 80,000 years to grow again so it, so on the time scale of a few hundred years there isn't going to be a massive growth of ice sheets either Marie okay. asks, what's the what cause is the cause of the, of the asymmetries around the equator that you mentioned? Okay, so I'm going to show the screen again. Um, okay. So the asymmetry in the short wave is due to the fact that in the antarctic there is an ice cap um whereas in the arctic there is an ocean which has got some of the time sea ice on it so they're contrasting in that respect because the north pole is basically an ocean surrounded by land whereas the south pole is basically land surrounded by an ocean and that also accounts for the difference here in the long wave. Um, the long wave leaving the South Pole is less because it's uh, colder, because it's higher, because the ice sheet is thicker. These dips here are due to the very thick clouds in the low latitudes. Um, so the, at the equator, it's cloudy pretty much all the time. Tons of evaporation, tons of rain, lots of thunderstorms. And so that's why you get these dips. Now, over here on the northward heat transport thing, the, the full curve is pretty smooth. Um, the asymmetry is mainly coming from the ocean. So the, the amount of heat carried by the ocean in the northern hemisphere is quite a lot larger than the heat carried um, southward in the southern hemisphere. That's the principal asymmetry. The reason for that is, I guess there's two, two reasons, um, or perhaps one reason, then a kind of like follow on. Uh, it's mainly to do with the, the system of currents in the Atlantic Ocean, of which the Gulf Stream is part. The system of currents that I was just talking about that might weaken, that we think is going to weaken, that possibly shut down. And that carries a lot of heat in the Atlantic Basin northwards both in the Northern Hemisphere and kind of paradoxically in the Southern Hemisphere in the South Atlantic too. So the ocean currents are carrying the heat um, north towards the equator in the South Atlantic, um, which is why th there's this asymmetry here. But the, the ocean is also quite asymmetric with respect to the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. There's much more ocean in the Southern Hemisphere than there is in the Northern Hemisphere, whereas for the atmosphere, that's much more symmetric there's a question from george um okay. no. warming since our lightest ice age began about 2.6 million years ago has occurred a number of times does that mean that global warming can't actually be stopped um so it i think the answer to that depends on what you mean by can it be stopped so global warming is a fact uh, planet has warmed by about a degree, uh, varies from place to place. It's more over land than it is over the ocean, but the average over the entire planet is about a degree since about 1850. Um, it's going to continue to warm. And I think 
more or less we're locked in to 2050 to mid-century in other words what i mean by that is we can't there's just too much momentum in the infrastructure for power generation to switch on a time scale shorter than that so global warming will increase i think at least as far as 2050 the question is will it exceed a particular threshold like two degrees c is often the number which is discussed and so that depends what happens for our changes to infrastructure in the coming decades and our switch to renewable and carbon neutral energy sources and if we're super aggressive about that then the warming may well be constrained to not exceed two degrees c on a global average and um, it may well slow down a lot in the second half of the 21st century um yeah it's so it's interesting that i mean i didn't talk about this but the earth moves in and out of, of periods of ice ages so we're in a period of ice ages now but 15 million years ago though we were not in a period of ice ages we don't really understand why that is um Adrian asked i don't know when the early. next ice age will happen i think global warming is going to delay it significantly it might stop this epoch of ice ages could we go back to an earlier slide what was causing what looks like current conditions Perhaps you could tell me which describe slide. the slide <clears throat> i show you them all it's uh, slide number i just saw it number six oh sorry sorry go ahead i couldn't hear that slide number six slide number six yeah i've been muted the whole time okay slide number six yes what was the question so um current is zero, right? And this is 120,000 years ago. Yep. And yet, skip all the noise in between, this set of data looks very similar to this set of data. Why is that? So the, the time period, the cycle for the glaciation and then the deglaciation is about 100,000 or 120,000 years. And this is the most recent in a sequence of about 10 or 15 glaciations and then deglaciations. And you're right to point out that it more or less ends like today where it began, like temperature variation, CO2 and sea level are more or less in the same place. Um, that's not always the case, but it, it often gets pretty back pretty close to the starting point. Now, the reason it's 100 or 120,000 years is interesting, um, not entirely understood, but we have a pretty strong idea that it is due to changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. So, for example, the Earth's orbit around the sun is um, not exactly circular, it's an ellipse or pretty close to an ellipse. So it has an eccentricity, which is a deviation from being a circle. That eccentricity can change. It also means that the sun, the Earth is closest to the sun at a certain time of year. I think that is currently in January, that it is at other times of year. And that can also change. Um, so that's one part of the orbital uh, dynamics of the Earth that can change. The other thing is that the tilt of the Earth's spin axis with respect to the orbital plane around the sun can vary it's called precession like a spinning top um, and so that means that you get more or less radiation sunshine in the summers than you do at other times as this precessional cycle plays out um, compared to other seasons and other latitudes now we know what the, the periods of those orbital variations are very accurately. And one of them, a big one, is about 120,000 years. So we think 
that that period is set by the orbital forcing. But that, that's not a complete explanation because there are because these changes in the orbit are quite small and therefore the changes in the solar radiation that reach the, reaches the surface of the earth are also quite small but we see quite big changes in climate and so making that marry up is a little harder adrian did that answer your question It's too complicated for my brain. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you want me to? Do you want to ask it again, and I can? No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd I'd uh, I'd like to figure out when you're giving another lecture so I can attend a, a, a second round. Well, uh, we're trying to get him to do a, a, an actual a class, maybe on on oceanography or climate. So that would be great. Um, uh, so um, uh, everybody, um, stay tuned on that. This is this uh, this is a teaser from Dr. Haynes, but I think it's interesting because we, we so much so often our presentations get down in the weeds, uh, um, literally in terms of we're looking at individual plants or animals or uh, organisms, and this was a really wonderful um, change of pace where we're looking at more of a global uh, perspective. And um, I, I think that it, it, it is very helpful to, to take a, a step back and do that. We did have a question, Dave of Maryland asked if there was any way to, they wanna look at these um, and study your graphs more. There's another way to get um, this presentation so that they can go through that again. Sure. So I can email it to you, Roman. The, the movies will just be stills, but I can email you a set of uh, slides okay and i then welcome I, any emails or whatever just reach out i'm happy to to chat wonderful well thank you very much um dr hayne tom and uh, mason just got in from his baseball game so he, he he got up here and he's like what is he doing on the screen today so um this has been wonderful and I do hope that we, I hope you need to get to our museum and come see us in person and, come, and then love to. get to know us a little bit better and maybe uh, come do some more teaching for us. We'd love it. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you, uh, hopefully we'll see you at World Turtle Day uh, on Sunday. Uh, if not, uh, we'll see you back online for one of uh, the presentations. So stay well, stay curious, and stay outside, stay exploring. All right, everybody, take care. That was a great talk. Thank you very much.